city could see them. The news media rushed out to National Airport and uh, were going to take pictures of the radar screens that were picking them up, and they got chased out. National security. And then later, we were told it was just temperature inversion. <laughs> Swamp gas. Swamp gas. Now, w one of the reasons for this uh, uh, secrecy was because they commissioned the Brush Brookings Institution to do a study to try to figure out what, what happens if a, a less advanced culture comes into contact with a more technological advanced culture. So the Brookings Institution went back. All they had to work with was history. So they went back and said, well, they said, Earth civilization may topple if faced by a race of superior beings. Okay, in other words, man, stock market could crash. <laughs> you know, uh, we might, lay, you know, and here's the clincher. What was left unsaid, because the true rulers of this country, and I'm not talking about the president or the congressman, or uh, I'm talking about the people who run the banks, people who own the banks, the people who own the Federal Reserve System, I'm talking about the people who really run this country. They owe their wealth and their power to their monopolies over energy, medicine, telecommunications, transportation. Okay? They don't really, drugs, of course. They don't really care if you know that there's extraterrestrials out there. Obviously, I mean, Star Trek, Star Wars, The X-Files. By the way, a new movie out right now, Race to Witch Mountain, go see it. Pretty good. It's really interesting. The DODs, the bad guys, the aliens are the good guys. Ah, and, and it shows, it kind of makes fun of the UFO crowd, and yet, if you think about it at the end of the program, it's, well, those guys were right. So, we're in a reverse conditioning process now. But anyway, yeah, they don't care if you know about aliens. But if you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that extraterrestrials exist, then you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that there is alternative technology. And you're not going to sit still for $4 a gallon gasoline prices and for this crappy drugs that they're pushing off on everybody, and et cetera, et cetera. That's the reason for the secrecy. But they used the Brookings Institution report for a good number of years to say, we can't release this to the public or they'll panic, you know. And you know what? Actually, I'll try to, to try to give the devil his due. There is some reason for that. In 1947 or by 1950, uh, this was only uh, 10 years or so more since the famous War of the Worlds broadcast by Orson Welles, 1938. And, number one, I don't think it's really proper to, to judge that against a calm and reasoned release of information. In other words, Orson Welles, some of you are probably very familiar with it, some of you are not. In 1938, Orson Welles took H.G. Um, uh, Wells' book, The War of the Worlds, and dramatized it on the Mercury Theater of the Air on radio, which was a national radio broadcast. And they did it like it was a live report, okay? And at the very beginning of the program, they said, Hey, happy Halloween. Here's a, here's a program to scare you. And this is all just made up. And, you know, ha have a happy Halloween. But then they started on the program, and you'd hear dance music. And they said, We interrupt this program to bring you a news flash from New Jersey. These cylinders have landed, and uh, something seems to be coming out. A few minutes later, you go back to music. They said, We break in again. Those cylinders, something's coming out of the cylinders, and then they're blowing up whole cities, and uh, people are dying. Oh my God, the humanity, you know. Well, no wonder people panic. You know, they turn in a little bit late, they didn't get the word that this wasn't real. And they didn't have other channels to go to like we do now. Those of you who are my age or so might recall at the time of the Kennedy assassination, you turn on every radio station, every TV station, what did you get? The Kennedy assassination. They preempted everything. 9-11 wasn't even that way. 9-11, all the news channels and all the broadcast channels were all talking about 9-11, but you could still turn to cable and satellite, you can watch a movie and you can act like it wasn't happening. So, but back then in radio, that was all they had. So yes, there was a lot of people who panicked and stampeded. And this was not lost on these people. 
So between the Brookings Institution report and the recent memory, there might have been some reason at that point to at least play down the idea of extraterrestrial visitation. But the time has long passed. We've all grown up with Star Wars, Star Trek. You ask any young person today, what about ETs? And they go, yeah, so what? <laughs> you know, they're used to it. But all the way back there in 1952, they instituted a policy of control and denial with an added factor of ridicule. You didn't see anything, and if you keep saying you did, then you probably need psychological counseling. And this has been extremely effective in keeping this whole topic off the table. This is why in 1997, when I published Alien Agenda, which was nothing but a report on what was available to the public about UFOs and extraterrestrials, I'm boycotted. I'm shunned. This is why Kevin doesn't even, want, doesn't even want to be associated with anybody that talked about UFOs. Nobody in the media today wants to touch it. But thankfully, it is now changing. And again, let me reemphasize. If you dismiss the topic of UFOs and extraterrestrials, you'll never figure out what's really going on in the world because you're throwing out a very big and important piece of the puzzle. Um, did Kennedy know about all this? Uh, the tabloids reported that he was shot to keep, the, to keep from revealing to the people uh, that the reality of UFOs. Now, when I first heard this back in the 70s, I snickered and I said, no way. But yet, there may be a modicum of truth to this. Because we found from the Counterintelligence Corps report of 1947, way back at the back, it states that it has become known to counterintelligence that some of the recovery operation was shared with Representative John F. Kennedy, Massachusetts Democrat, elected to Congress in 46, son of Joseph P. Kennedy, who was on the Commission of Organization of the Executive Branch of the government. Kennedy had limited duty as naval intelligence, a naval officer assigned to naval intelligence during the war, and is believed that the information was obtained from a source in Congress who was close to the Secretary of the Air Force. How many of you knew that John F. Kennedy had been with naval intelligence? Not very many. But he was. And I won't go into that whole story. That's inconvenient. You know that. But that's true. So this is, this is a true remark, and this is true information. So this that tells us that John F. Kennedy in 1947 was one of the few people who knew that Roswell was real. So that brings us to 1961. June, where he is ordering, he wrote a brief summary of your, uh, at your earliest convenience, uh, a review of MJ-12 intelligence operations. Uh-oh, he wants to know about MJ-12. He wants to know about the se most secret thing we had going, because MJ-12 was in charge of UFOs. Whose signature was that? That's John F. Kennedy's. That's his signature. Now, Glenn Pace and Rufus Bond in uh, 1963 were photographers working at what is now uh, Area 51. And I think they were calling it Groom Lake at the time. Now they didn't have access to any alien technology or any UFO secrets, but they did share a lunchroom with some of the Nazi scientists who were still there working and who probably did have access to some of our most secret UFO uh, information. And they tell the story that uh, in the fall, of early fall of, uh, or actually this was probably in the spring or early summer of 1963, because it had to be before the Merrill Monroe Memo, they, uh, they said these German scientists and these other scientists had been working at the very top secret levels at Area 51 were laughing and snickering because they said the president was going to come for a visit. And the idea was, we'll give him the usual dog and pony show and tell him there's nothing here and buy him a lunch and he'll go away. Then they said that after the presidential visit in this lunchroom, everybody was scowling and cursing and saying, rah, 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 he's going to cut our budget. And obviously the visit was not a pleasant experience. So apparently what happened was, 
Kennedy shows up. They give him the usual runaround. Nothing here, Mr. President, but based on that document from...